All right, um, we are live. Thank you for joining us for our noon Lift Live Bible study. And uh, if you are joining us, uh, put your name down there in the comments so I know you're here. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, this will be uh, part number five on relationships. And we are talking about dealing with conflict in relationships today. Um, this is probably the last one we're going to do on relationships. Um, I had a couple folks tell me that they really appreciated it and that they thought it was really helpful. Um, so uh, I don't know what we're going to do next, but it sounds like um, things more in that vein might be more helpful for folks um, in, uh, instead of maybe just more um, straight, I don't know, just talking about the Bible in general. So um, I would, uh, if you have some ideas about things that would be helpful for you, um, since we, we did relationships, we did leadership, um, we, you know, and as part of relationships, we talked about communication, um, and we're going to talk about conflict today. So if there's like maybe like if you wanted to do a Bible study on communicating effectively, um, just in general, uh, let me know. I'm going to kind of look through the resources that I have. Um, but you can put it in the comments and um, I'll, I will take a look at it, uh, look at those comments and uh, figure out if there's a topic that would work out really well for our next study. Um, and let's see, well, let's, let's jump in. I, I just want a quick word of, on um, uh, the home groups. So we're having home groups meeting Monday, uh, Thursday and Friday. And um, the Friday group leader has um, uh, asked because she's helping with um, election registration to uh, kind of put that group on hiatus until after the election, which is five weeks away. Uh, so I'm going to contact some folks in that group just to see if one of them would like to maybe take over leadership for the next five weeks so we can continue to have it meet in case there's new folks coming on board that want to join on that night. Um, but also if, if, if you feel led by God, um, and I'm really asking you to pray about this, um, if you have led groups in the past and enjoyed it, or if you feel like God is really leading you to lead a group. And when I say lead, it's really facilitate. Um, the information is provided to you. The discussion questions are provided. Um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not your opinion. Um, it really is just allowing the group to discuss. You're facilitating the discussion so you don't have to have any answers. In fact, that's better if you don't have answers because it's, it, the group really needs to kind of, kind of talk. So, um, but if that sounds like something that you would enjoy doing, I, I could really use, um, some leaders for Tuesday night in particular. I've had some interest in a Tuesday night group. Um, and then also Wednesday is available. Uh, we are going to be starting a new study on prayer um, next week uh, with our small groups. So if you're interested in that, and um, uh, Pastor Shante had recommended the book, The Circle Maker, which um, I started reading and um, it's fantastic. Uh, so I'm actually going to combine some of that. They have a participants guide for that. I'm going to combine some of that with the Praying with Paul study that um, I had already selected to do for, for our groups. So um, just be on the lookout for, for, for that if, and, and join a group if you're interested, um, a home group. It's a good way to stay connected to people, particularly during this time of, of COVID and social distancing. All right, well, let's pray and then we're going to get started. Um, so yeah, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the gift of technology that allows us to have this Bible study. Lord, we thank you that you love us immensely and and tenderly and that uh, you desire for us to grow not only in our faith but as um, uh, people of God and, and just as human beings so that we can be more effective in the world as witnesses to your great love and to your kingdom and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray that this will be um, a, a holy time, an effective time, a time of blessing for folks um, and helpful to them in their lives as uh, followers of Jesus Christ. That's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so yeah, we're talking about dealing with conflict in relationships, but um, really any relationship, not just a romantic relationship, you're going to have conflict. Um, and one of the things that the book, and I, I just as a reminder, the book that we're using is um, Attached uh, by uh, Dr. Amir Levine and Rachel um, Heller. And it's about attachment styles, anxious, avoidant, and secure attachment styles. Um, 
And so what they say in the book is that um, an absence of conflict in a relationship does not mean a successful relationship. And I think that's important to recognize. Um, some people think uh, a good relationship is one where, where people don't argue, um, but that's not it at all. And it's not even about the amount of argument that you do. Uh, it's, it, it comes down to what you argue about and how you treat one another during the argument. Those two things are key in terms of, of dealing with conflict. Um, and, and the reason why it's um, how you deal with conflict um, in terms of how you treat the other person, because if you don't respect the other person, then um, they're going to know that, and um, and that's you're not going to get anything solved um, in the argument. And in the terms of what you argue about, so um, intimacy issues they say are things that serious are serious things that if you have conflict around instant intimacy issues, those are things that you might need to seek professional help with. Um, and talk those out with a, a professional counselor. Um, the, the types of things, though, that most people argue about are what they call bread and butter items. And that's just the everyday things that, that we get upset about. You know, um, who, who's picking the kids up from school tomorrow or, after, or you know, who's making lunches, who's taking out the trash, um, uh, those types of things. Or why did you buy that? You know, um, or why did you spend money on that? You know, those kinds of things are the, what they call bread and butter items. Those are just things that, that happen in everyday life as you um, go through life and that you have conflict around. Um, but if you treat one another with respect and um, continue to love each other and communicate that you love the person regardless of whether you agree with them or not, um, that that um, will be um, the, the key to, to successfully dealing with conflict in a relationship. Um, so um, it's not about how, how much you disagree, but it's how you treat one another in the disagreement and what you disagree about. Um, so um, the big thing is, because we've talked about this uh, as part of this study the last few weeks, is um, that if you are, treat the other person as the enemy or you feel as though you're being treated like you're the enemy in the relationship, uh, then that's not a healthy relationship. It's not a good relationship. Um, if it's a relationship that you can get out of, you should. We did talk about getting out of relationships a few weeks ago. Um, but um, the other side is that you should be treated like royalty in the relationship, and that's how they put it in the book. You need to be treated like you're royalty, that you are respected, your opinion matters, you are included in decision making. Those are some of the things that, um, uh, that show you are being treated um, at, like royalty in the relationship. You're re being treated with respect uh, and, and honor in the relationship. Um, and so uh, that comes, that is key to how you deal with disagreements and conflict in relationship because um, you can have conflict and if you treat one another with respect, you love each other, you treat each other like royalty, that each other's opinion matters. Remember, we've talked consistently about this in terms of this particular study. One of the things that, that, that um, Dr. Levine talks about in the book is that they are, we are, we are a relationship consists of two independent individuals who are dependent on each other. Um, so you have to honor each other's independence as part of that um, relationship and, and, and when you have a disagreement or conflict. All right. So um, one of the things that we've talked about as part of this, because um, in the attachment styles, anxious people and, and avoidant attachment styles tend to draw each other like magnets. And they can become very toxic very quickly because the avoidant person, when they start sensing intimacy, even though they want it, they will withdraw because they feel like they're losing their independence and that their independence is the most important thing to them. An anxious person, um, they crave that intimacy and they will do anything to get it. And so when an avoidant person starts to draw back, then they just, they push forward, they push more and that causes all kinds of conflict. So when you're talking about dealing with conflict, particularly around intimacy issues. If you're an anxious person or an avoidant person in a relationship with someone who's the opposite of you, they're avoidant or anxious, then um, you, you probably need to go see somebody and help work through those issues. Um, now, if you're involved with somebody who's in a secure, who has a secure attachment style, um, and again, those are people who um, they're not threatened that their partner's going to leave them, they're not worried that that's an issue, um, 
and uh, not that they wouldn't be heartbroken if if the person that they love did leave them they're just it's just not it's not something that they worry about right they're secure they know that they are worthy of love and affection and and that makes them secure in the relationship um and so um that's why secure people are good for those who are an anxious or avoidant person because they can help them feel secure as well so the, the thing that they say in the book that's really fascinating to me is that people who are in a secure attachment style they um, they deal with conflict really well. And part of the reason is, is because they value, um, I was just looking here real quick, sorry. Uh, they value um, uh, the other person, right? They treat them like royalty. They treat them like their opinion matters. Um, their decision, their, their, their being part of the decision in, in the relationship is important. So whatever the degree, the disagreement is about, um, they don't just they don't capitulate um, when there's when there's conflict, but the, you know they still say hey this is what, how I feel. But they communicate to the other person that even if they disagree, that the relationship is not in danger, right? They communicate that they are secure, that the relationship is not in danger if we're in conflict, because you know if you have conflict in a relationship and you are avoidant or anxious, especially if you're anxious, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, the relationship's over, and that's all you're gonna think about, particularly if you're anxious, not if you're avoidant, but if you're anxious. And it's just gonna snowball and make things worse, um, and it's gonna actually escalate conflict and cause more problems. So um, the, the scripture I wanted us to start out with um, is uh, Luke 9, verses 52, the second half of that verse, 52b through 55. And I'll explain why um, uh, some of these may seem like they don't quite fit, and, and I'll, I'm going to try to do my best to explain why I chose them. Um, but I, I want us to start out with Luke chapter 9, verses 52b through 55. So Luke chapter 9, and uh, this is 52. B. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for Jesus, but they did not. Uh, they did not receive him. The Samaritans did not receive him. The town didn't receive him, because his fate, face was set toward Jerusalem. And this goes back to the fact that um, Samaritans believed that that they could worship God um, outside of Jerusalem. Um, uh, more traditional Orthodox Jews believed that they only could worship God in Jerusalem, that that was the, the place to worship. And so the fact that they, that they said Jesus is coming on his way to Jerusalem, well, they're like, well, you know, we don't want you to stop here then, right? That's why. Um, and when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Um, and some, some uh, um, different... Uh, Versions also include uh, Jesus saying, Do you not know what spirit you are of? For the Son of Man has not come to destroy the lives of human beings, but to save them. Um, so the reason why I chose that is because um, one of the things that I think we, we lose sight of is the fact that Jesus and the disciples spent a lot of time together. And they had conflict. Um, there are instances in the New Testament where Jesus gets upset with them. You know, he also got upset with the religious leaders. He had obvious some some big time throwdowns with the religious leaders of his day. Um, you know, in Mark chapter three, which is one of my favorite stories about Jesus, when he gets really angry at the lack of compassion that the Sadducees and Pharisees have for this man with a withered hand. Um, so you know, Jesus Jesus had conflict with people. Um, even though he was the son of God, he was um, the uh, walking embodiment of perfect love on the earth. Um, so he still had conflict with people, um, but he was able to um, keep those relationships uh, because uh, um, he communicated to people that they were important, that they mattered, that they were worthy of love and affection, and that they were important. And we're going to look at an example of that here in a little bit too. Um, but so what I wanted to point out from this particular passage in Luke uh, chapter 9 is that uh, there's conflict there. And the word where it says that Jesus rebuked them, um, if you look, that, look up that word in the Greek, it means that he reprimanded them firmly. It wasn't like he was like, oh, you guys. Like he was like, you are wrong, um, and this is why you're wrong. Like he was very firm with them. Um, and, and, and so uh, he addressed the issue head on. Um, he didn't waffle. And, and so he, he took the conflict 
as it was right in front of him and dealt with it immediately. And we're going to look at five ways to deal with conflict. And those are some of the key things to dealing with conflict effectively is um, that you have to address it when it happens. You have to address it head on. You can't beat around the bush. Um, and you, you have to be firm about your feelings, how you're feeling in the situation. Not that you're right, but how you're feeling. And, and Jesus did that. He said, don't, don't you know? I didn't come to destroy human lives. I came to save them. You know, he's he's standing firmly in his position um, while he's he's telling the, the disciples, hey, this is an issue of conflict. Um, and so that's important. So if you're dealing with conflict, you want to stand you're in your position. This is what why I believe what I believe and, and stand firm in that position while at the same time respecting the other person and their opinion. All right. Um, so let's go into those five things for dealing with conflict. And I have some scripture references that we're going to look at for each one. So the, the, the first of the five for um, dealing with conflict effectively is show basic concern for the other person's well-being. If you have the book, it's on page 245. Um, show basic concern for the other person's well-being. Um, again, that it comes back to how the secure um, attachment style folks um, communicate that the um, that they care about the other person. Their well-being is important. Um, the relationship is not in danger if we disagree, right? The, um, they care about the other person. And the scripture I want to look at for that is Luke chapter 10. So if you still have your Bibles open or your, you still have your, your, your phone open to, to Luke chapter 9, just scroll down or flip over to chapter 10. And we're going to look at verses 25 and 26. Uh, Luke chapter 10, 25 and 26. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? Now, this comes back to how we view Jesus. Jesus is not being snarky there, like, you know, well, how do you read the law? He's genuinely asking this lawyer, well, how do you understand? You know, what is your understanding of the question that you're asking? Um, that shows he cares about the well-being of this lawyer. Um, and, I, uh, you know, it's kind of kind of reminds me of the young rich ruler who comes to Jesus and says, you know, I want to follow you. And it says Jesus um, loved him. Um, and then he tells the, the rich young ruler to sell everything that he has and follow, follow him, follow Jesus. And the young man goes away sad. And, um, and I think when it says Jesus loved him, you know, Jesus was genuinely concerned about the well-being of the rich young ruler. He's genuinely concerned about this lawyer and what he thinks. So if you want to deal effectively with conflict in a relationship, you have to genuinely love the other person that you're in conflict with. Number two, maintain focus on the problem at hand. Maintain focus on the problem of, at hand. Um, and again, that's what I said, you know, you got to, when a situation happens, you have to address it. Don't stew on it. Don't think about it. Don't fret about it. Um, just calmly address the situation um, as it happens uh, and, and deal with it um, and stay focused on the problem at hand. The other thing about that is too is, you know, what happens a lot of times is if you don't deal with conflict when it happens um, and you let things build up, then when when a conflict arises, suddenly you start pulling all these other things out of the past. Well, remember when you did this or remember when that happened. And that's not helpful and that's not going to solve the problem at hand. So when they say uh, maintain focus on the, on the problem you're dealing with right then, um, that means don't, don't pull out things from the past. You know, deal with what's right in front of you. And the scripture we're going to look at for that is Luke 12. So we're staying in Luke. Just flip over a couple pages to Luke chapter 12 or scroll down. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about what your uh, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. So that might seem like an odd thing um, where it says to to talk about when we say maintain focus on the problem at hand. And the reason I chose that is because um, this uh, is usually subtitled in most Bibles as "Do not worry." Um, whenever you do a Bible study about worry, um, this is always going to come up. These particular verses. Um, so don't worry about the past, like we said, maintain focus on the problem at hand. Um, but um, also, I think it's a good thing to remember, and, and, and I keep repeating this, but if you're, if you're secure in the relationship, then you, you want to communicate to the other person 
that they don't need to worry about the relationship um, and, and whether it's going to last or not. Like if you go into a conflict and you're communicating to the other person, hey, um, this could end the relationship, um, then uh, you're causing that person to worry about something more than the problem at hand. Uh, so you want to communicate to the other person when you're dealing with conflict effectively that they don't have to worry about the relationship itself, um, that the relationship is still good, you still love the person, all will be well, but we need to deal with this situation at hand. Number three, refrain from generalizing the conflict. Refrain from generalizing the conflict. Again, that's very what we've already talked about. Be specific about what the conflict is and what you're dealing with. Um, also, when you generalize, like if you, if you kind of beat around the bush when there's a conflict, um, then you're, you're, you're creating more conflict. Does that make sense? Like if you're not, if you, if you're not being specific, if you're generalizing the conflict, um, you need to, you're not being, well, you're not being specific, but it's almost like you're shrinking from the problem, if that makes sense. Like you're, you're saying, well, the problem's not really that bad, or maybe this isn't really the real problem. There's other things going on. You know, it's just so, again, just be specific um, uh, about what the issue is. And I want us to look at Matthew 17. So flip over to the first gospel in the New Testament, if you're looking in your Bible, um, or if you're um, looking it up online, look up Matthew 17, verses 18 through 21. And uh, these uh, are the scriptures from Matthew. So starting with 18. Uh, and Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and the boy was instant, instantly cured. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move. Uh, from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Um, so that's a whole other thing, talking about faith and, and prayer, and th that's, that's, that's a good thing to unpack right there. Um, but in terms of dealing with conflict, so um, the disciples encountered this boy who, um, in some versions of Scripture, say that he had epileptic, epileptic seizures, um, and the parents, you know, come to Jesus and say, hey, the, he's possessed by a demon, and, you know, he'll have these convulsions and throw him into the fire and and the disciples pray for the boy and nothing happens and so Jesus comes along and casts the demon out or heals the boy uh, and so the disciples were like you know hey why didn't why um, why why didn't this work for us and again Jesus is very clear he doesn't beat around the bush he says um, you had little faith otherwise you could do this um, and and so he's really challenging the disciples um, in in what the core issue is for them in terms of their ability to, to do things. Um, so he's being very specific and addressing the conflict head on. He's not beating around the bush. All right, number four, be willing to engage. Be willing to engage. Uh, so there are some people who are conflict avoidant. They would rather just ignore conflict and hope it goes away, but that's not effective um, and it's only gonna cause things to get worse. So again, we've been talking, be specific, deal with it immediately. Um, so uh, don't avoid it, be willing to engage. Um, communicate what, uh, what you feel and what, what, you, uh, what, you, what your concerns are. And so I wanted us to look at the next, the last two, number four and five, we're gonna look at 1 Samuel uh, chapter one, verses nine through 15. So this is in the Old Testament, if you wanna flip over to 1 Samuel. And this is how Samuel the prophet uh, was born. Um, his mother, Hannah, um, was uh, without a child, and she desperately wanted a child. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verse 9. After they had eaten and uh, drank at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look upon the, the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will uh, give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. 
As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Uh, 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 Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. So this is a, this is a really good example. Um, so Eli saw a conflict. I, I think I have a drunk woman in my church, right? And um, how am I going to deal with this? He addresses the issue head on, um, maybe not in the most compassionate way. A better way might have been to say, you look distressed. <laughs> but, um, but again, she, in, in terms of her, her concern, um, her conflict is she wants a child. She can't have a child. She goes directly to God, and she is very specific. God, I want a male child. And if you give me a male child, I will present him as a Nazarite uh, to serve you all of his life. Um, she's very specific about her concern, about what her conflict is. Um, Eli is concerned, uh, very specific about his. They don't um, walk around the issue or beat around the bush. Hannah doesn't say, oh, I'm so sorry, um, Mr. Priest, sir. Um, I, I'm just going to go away now. No, she's very direct with Eli um, about what her situation is. Again, they're being very, they're, they're engaging in their conflict and making it and effective, effectively communicating. Um, and again, that, that's, that was, and that's the next and the last point of the five effective ways to deal with conflict. Number five is effectively communicate your feelings and needs. And um, Eli did that, Hannah did that, and as a result, they both get what they want. Hannah gets to leave the temple because Eli wants her to leave, and Hannah gets her child. Because in verse 17, Eli says, Go in peace, the God of Israel, grant the petition you have made to him. So Eli tells her, God's going to answer your prayer, go. So because they effectively dealt with this situation, um, this conflict, they effectively um, communicated and, and handled uh, this conflict, they both got what they wanted. All right. Um, so that's uh, that's the that's really all I have. I, I I did want to read one thing real quickly from page two fifty one because I thought this was really interesting and I think this would be really helpful. And it comes back to the fact that we're human beings, that we are spiritual beings that live in a, in a body, but that our bodies are important. God created them, and God showed that by coming in um, by sending Jesus. So God in the flesh is Jesus. God is demonstrating to us the importance of our physical bodies. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about in Bible study um, in our conclusion um, of the unafraid study was death and dying. The, the fact that the, the, the Christian hope and promise that we have believed in 2,000 years is that we will have new bodies in the new heaven and new earth that are imperishable. Say amen, somebody. Um, that won't grow old or <laughs> get out of shape. Um, but... Uh, our bodies matter to God. They're important. Like they're they're important to us. They're important to God. Um, and so, this is how God has has created us. And this is called preventing conflict, attachment biology 101. This is how God has created us. When it comes to conflict, it's not always about who did what to whom, or how to compromise, or even how to express yourself more effectively. Sometimes understanding the basic biology of attachment helps you prevent conflict before it can happen. Oxyto oxytocin, a hormone and neuropeptide that has gotten a lot of press coverage lately, plays a major role in attachment processes and serves several purposes. It causes women to go into labor, strengthens attachment, and serves as a social cohesion hormone by increasing trust and cooperation. We get a boost of oxytocin in our brain during orgasm and even when we cuddle which is why it's been tagged the cuddle hormone. How is oxytocin related to conflict and, redu and uh, reduction? Sometimes we spend less quality time with our partner, especially when other demands on us are pressing. However, neuroscience findings suggest that we would change, if we would change our priorities uh, by, forge, foregoing close, uh, by not foregoing closeness with our partners, um, then we will receive the mis uh, we will receive our oxytocin boost instead of miss it. 
And when we receive that boost, it makes us more agreeable to the world around us and less vulnerable to conflict. Uh, so essentially what he's saying is that God has created us with this hormone, oxytocin, and that when we are cuddle and are close to somebody, and intimate with somebody, that, that, we, that it gets released and we get a boost. And that makes us less likely to want to engage in conflict with somebody, makes us much more agreeable, makes us much easier to get along with others. So um, that's how God created us, right? We are created to be in relationship with people. Um, I put on the, the list of scriptures, um, uh, Genesis 1, chapter 26, uh, the first part of that verse, A, uh, Genesis 1, 26a, which basically God says, let us create humankind in our image. And God and God's self, our image, God and God's self is um, in relationship, right? Uh, uh, we believe in a trinity, so we believe there's um, God the Creator, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and that they work in perfect harmony and exist as one, three in one. That's the, the Trinitarian belief of Christianity um, that we affirm. And... Uh, that, that Jesus is fully God, the Holy Spirit is fully God, and uh, that, they, that they exist in relationship. God's very being is relationship. And so we, being created in God's image, are created in the image of relationship, not only with God, but with each other. We are to be in relationship with one another. So that means we have to deal with conflict, right? And we need to deal with it effectively. Okay, so I hope this was helpful to you all. Um, I, I'm going to close us in prayer and uh yeah i know we we're right we're running just a little bit over but hopefully this was helpful uh, so let's pray gracious god we thank you that we are created in your good image we are created to be in relationship with you and with one another um, and that that means that we're going to have conflict but you have created ways for us to deal effectively with that conflict uh, remind us bring to our memory by your holy spirit those things that we need to uh, uh, deal with conflict effectively, to um, be firm, address the situation as it happens, um, communicate our feelings effectively, but most importantly, let the other person know that their opinion matters, that they're important, and that because we're in conflict, it doesn't mean the relationship is in danger of ending, that we still want the relationship to continue, we just want to deal with our conflict. And we pray and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I hope, again, that this was helpful, and uh, we will see you all next week. I know we're over time. God bless you, and um, have a wonderful day. Talk to you later. Bye.